coercion and consent. In this lesson, we're going to look at methods of control that were used uh, by the Nazi party, things such as the Gestapo, the secret police, and also certain groups that actually supported Hitler and the Nazi party. Uh, certainly there was not widespread opposition. It would be wrong to exaggerate and paint a picture that the vast majority of Germans were kept in line by fear. There was also popular support, but it's undeniable there was oppression and coercion. Coercion basically means forcing somebody to do something which, excuse me, forcing somebody to do something against their will. There was, however, consent. Hitler was reasonably popular uh, throughout the 1930s, more so than the Nazi Party itself, actually. But there was also consent, especially from certain groups in society. So how did the Nazis deal with their opponents? Who agreed with what Hitler was doing? Who opposed him? And how were they treated? You should actually make notes if you're a GCSE student under those three headings. So selective repression. Not every group in society was repressed. Some were supporters of Hitler or were important to him in many ways. So powerful groups, the industrialists, landowners and bankers, were left alone. Hitler wanted their support in order to fund his plans to prepare Germany for war and eventually prosecute that war. Other groups, however, Jews, gypsies, uh, homosexuals, beggars, they were terrorised by the regime. And there was police harassment in working class areas of cities because that's where the majority of support for socialism and communism was. So what did the Nazis do with those groups? Well, in terms of the people like the communists, the socialists, the trade unions, these were not popular with the upper classes or with the middle classes. So they were actually quite pleased to see the breakup and arrest of communist leaders and the breakup of trade unions. If you remember back in the Weimar period, big industries had struggled to make profits because trade unions had encouraged uh, strike action uh, and uh, extra pay and so on. So they were quite happy to see the breakup of the trade unions. And certainly after Hitler becomes chancellor, he consolidates his power by 1934 in the Enabling Act and opposition is violently crushed. Many communists are imprisoned, many trade unionists and so on. This is, these are the, the, the concentration camps such as Dachau are opened. There is something of a lull, a pause in persecution in 1936, largely because the, Ber the Berlin Olympics were being staged and the Nazis wanted to present a, an acceptable face to the outside world and all of those foreign journalists. Between 1937 and 1939, though, persecution of Jews and other groups designated undesirables was much more savage. You can see a picture here of Kristallnacht, the Night of the Long Knives, uh, in which Nazi uh, stormtroopers, with the encouragement of Goebbels, um, smashed up Jewish shops, businesses, and um, burned down synagogues. Uh, pretty horrific stuff, obviously. Um, and the... the, 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 the the irony on top of it, the, the sting in the tail, the, the, in the scorpion's tail, is that not only were Jewish people's businesses smashed up, they were actually forced to pay for all of the damage. And it's during this time, of course, between in the late 1930s, that Hitler is preparing for war. What about the church and political opposition? You would think uh, churches, remember that there's the Catholic Church, mostly in southern Germany, and Protestant churches in more in northern Germany. Now, these are supposed to be, if they're sort of obeying the teachings of Jesus about non-violence and being compassionate and caring for people, then they should really be against the Nazi party and everything it stands for. However, in the early 1930s, both the Catholic and Protestant churches did cooperate, largely through fear and intimidation and trying to protect themselves, I think is probably the best way to say it. A concordat was signed in July 1933 between the Pope in Rome uh, the head of the Catholic Church and the Nazi Party, and that was supposed to guarantee religious freedom in return for loyalty, or at least non-criticism of the Nazi Party. Well, the Nazis went ahead and they broke that agreement. Again, you might ask, why did the Pope of the Catholic Church make a deal with a horrific uh, figure in history like Hitler? You have to remember, though, this is at the beginning of the Nazi period, and certainly the Pope and the Catholic Church were not endorsing the horrors of the Holocaust and other things that were to follow. And in fact, 
as the Nazi regime went on, many priests did protest and subsequently were put in concentration camps. It doesn't mean the church actively supported the Nazis and their ideology. In fact, as I've already said, uh, many churchmen protested. The Nazis obviously broke their agreement with the Catholic Church, and Catholics were protesting both the right to worship freely as well as violations of human rights under the Nazi regime. The many violations of human rights. And it turned out that hundreds of clergy were sent to concentration camps. Protestants as well, and in 8, 1937, for example, 800 Protestant pastor, pa pastor is the, the word used in Protestant Christianity for sort of the, what, what would be a priest in the Catholic Church. So 800 were arrested. What was the price of resistance then? So certainly uh, certain sections of German society did resist, even if it was through grumbling or jokes or small actions, it was nonetheless resistance. And that never ceased. And it was in all walks of life, as I said. So it could be it could be a joke, it could be a criticism, it could be not giving the Heil Hitler salute, for example. Well, as time wore on, there were stiffer penalties for uh, any, any level of resistance, obviously low level to high level, persecution, uh, imprisonment, and even the death penalty. Uh, there was, um, I believe, later on in, in, in the Nazi regime, somebody was executed for the following joke. I'll tell you this joke. I'm not guaranteeing it's funny. Um, Hitler and Goebbels are on the balcony. This is a, the, just, this joke, I think, is in the late, later uh, part of the war when the war's not going well. So Hitler and Goebbels are on a balcony. Um, Hitler turns to Goebbels and says, uh, what would cheer people up in Berlin? And Goebbels says to Hitler, why don't you jump? Okay, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't say it was funny, nor am I very good at telling jokes, I apologise. But the person who told that joke certainly wasn't funny for him. He was executed. 1933 to 1939, 225,000 people are sentenced to imprisonment. It wouldn't necessarily be automatic death for minor offences against the Nazi party, criticisms and things. Um, that would simply be impractical, but it did mean a lot of people were imprisoned. And over the entire period of the Nazi regime, three million Germans in prison camps on political grounds. Methods of law enforcement. Well, the infamous SS Schutzstaffel, that means uh, bodyguard, they were in fact uh, the, the personal bodyguard of Hitler in 1925, and this sinister-looking gentleman and ex-chicken farmer, Heinrich Himmler, took over in 1929. Their numbers grew rapidly during that time from 200 to 50,000. Uh, members of the SS wore the infamous black uniform you can see over here um, with the death's head uh, for, for, for the, uh, the death's head battalions that ran the, the death camps. Initially the SS were under the SA, under the brown shirt stormtroopers, but after the night of the long knives, if you remember when Ernst Röhm and other potential obstacles to Hitler were murdered, the purge of the SA, well it's the SS that carried that out, and they were rewarded for their loyalty. In fact, the SS grew to be a massive organisation, almost a state within a state, uh, inside the Nazi party, even including entire army divisions which were given the best training and the best equipment. Here's a, a recruiting poster for the Waffen SS, that's the military branch of the SS. In 1936, all police forces in Germany were brought under the SS and under Himmler's authority. This included the secret police known as the Gestapo. Let's have a little look at the Gestapo. Uh, again, apologies to any German speakers. Geheime Staatspolizei, I'm sure I murdered that pronunciation. They were the secret police, and that's what Gestapo is short for. Uh, in 1933, Goering was in charge of the police. If you remember, that was quite instrumental. Goering was in charge of the police in Prussia. That's one of the things that helped Hitler and the Nazi party consolidate their dictatorship in that period of 1933 to 1934. Obviously, controlling the police helps you establish a dictatorship. In 1936, Himmler takes over the Gestapo, and their job is to discover enemies of the Nazi state by any means. They can break the law with impunity. Nothing will happen to them. They can tap phones, they can use violence, they can do anything they like, basically. They use uh, methods to increase fear and intimidation and reduce the possibility of resistance to the regime. Night arrests, obviously, if you're woken up in the middle of the night, you're going to be very disoriented. Torture, 
uh, I won't go into detail, but some pretty horrific torture, internment, obviously in concentration camps, and even execution, and very frequently prisoners were beaten to death in the Gestapo holding cells. The Malicious Practices Act of March 1933, that actually made uh, criticism of Hitler a criminal offence for which you could be imprisoned or even, in some cases, certainly later on, uh, executed. The, the sinister fact is that the Gestapo themselves never actually had massive numbers um, in, in vast areas of uh, rural Germany or towns and cities. There may be only one or two members of the Gestapo, so they actually relied on ordinary Germans, and some ordinary Germans were denouncers, informers, snoopers. They would spy on their neighbours and report suspicious activity to the Gestapo. There are huge uh, mountains of files collected by the Gestapo from informers in this way. Yeah, I basically just said that. <laughs> Loyal Germans, okay. So, uh, in summary, uh, selective repression, certain groups such as the industrial elite, rich bankers, etc., were not repressed uh, as they were valuable to Hitler in his aims. Uh, the church initially, so the Catholic Church, signed an agreement with Hitler under the Concordat, but the Nazis broke that agreement and more and more priests and pastors were imprisoned. Uh, although he never, um, the Nazis never closed the churches, that would have been too risky. And again, that questions the nature of how much it was actually a totalitarian regime. So yes, in many ways it was, but he wouldn't have dared close the churches. That would have created too much resistance. Well, the price of resistance itself, uh, concentration camps, uh, death penalty, uh, and the SS and Gestapo as methods of enforcing that, um, enforcing the regime. Okay, I hope you made some uh, decent notes there if you're a GCSE student, and good luck with the Zondel quiz.